In this week's In-Ear Insights, let's talk about all things data, data science, data analytics, data engineering. Katie, when you hear these terms, particularly data science and data analytics, to you, what is the difference between the two? I have a hard time differentiating the two because I feel like data science is the person and data analytics is the action. And so a data scientist is doing data analysis. And this is where I sort of struggle. And this is where I'm looking for more education is, you know, are you just advanced analytics? So you are an analyst who understands artificial intelligence and machine learning versus when I think data science, I always go back to my clinical roots. And so I always think about things like clinical trials and principal investigators. Um, But that's not what we're doing here. We're working with marketing data. It's commercial. And that's not to say that it's not similar in nature. You can't have a principal investigator for a marketing data analysis project. It's just the qualif the not the qualif the criteria are different. You know, you're not necessarily doing clinical trials to determine the efficacy of, you know, some sort of a drug intervention. You're trying to figure out the ROI of your ad campaign. And so I suppose if you take away, you know, the ad campaign versus, you know, drug intervention at the end of the day, you're still looking at just metrics and numbers. Um, but it, I think for me, it's just sort of a mind shift because one is more academic and one is more commercial. Uh, that's, a, that's a good starting place. Here's how I differentiate the two. What versus why? So data analytics, analytics, the, I mean, it comes from the Greek word online, right? Which means to unlock, to loosen up. Um, analytics is all about what happened? Right? We look at Google Analytics, we look at Facebook Analytics. What happened? Uh, did we have more conversions last week or less? Uh, things. When you get to the science part, the scientific method, hypothesis testing, things like that, that's that's why. So conversions went up 40% last week. Why? Why, why, did, why did that happen? And if it's a good thing, is it reproducible? Could we do it again? Right? Uh, or is it was it just a one time thing? Did we get mentioned on Tumblr or Slashdot or something? And we got a lot of traffic for no reason. And it's probably not something we can make happen again. So to me, that's the big dividing line is what versus why data science is used to explore why things happen. We do things like retroactive A B testing or any kind of A B testing is is, you know, why did this did this work? When you go to on a website and say, uh, we're going to change the copy on the Trust Insights website from you know uh, pract- pragmatic change management to do-it-yourself analytics. And we see one gets more lift than the other. Now we have a better idea of why we're getting conversion rates you know higher or lower because the copy changed. We changed the copy. We tested it. So to me, that's, that's the big difference. But I feel like that's a little too loose in terms of the definition because, you know, I've run A-B tests on the content on our website, but I'm not a data scientist. Um, Uh. And so, so, but this is where I think the education piece is important because, um, you know, I know the scientific method, I understand the scientific method, but did I follow it, you know, step by step by step? Maybe. You know, I wanted to understand if we change the copy on our homepage, would we get more conversions? That's my hypothesis. That's my experiment. Um, And then so I ran the test. I did the control in the experiment, which is part of that. Um, And then I got my results. And then I said, okay, what do I do now? And the what do I do now is I need to change the copy on the website. I need to find time to make updates. But is that too like so if that is what makes a data scientist then is it what is it the all marketers are data scientists not all data scientists are marketers no but i would say (laughs) if you if you successfully make toast and you don't like absolutely burn it right or or you forget you know you'll you remember to turn the toaster on. Um, are you a cook? Have, no. you, have you successfully cooked something? 
But I feel like these are titles that people work hard to earn. Um, it's sort of the, you know, I'm the CEO of my household because I pay the bills and I clean the dishes. You know, yeah, I can say that, but that doesn't really hold any weight in the outside world. I would argue from the perspective of marketers trying to figure out where to direct their careers and, and professional growth, that it's okay in this case, right? If you are using the scientific method and scientific principles and you're doing it correctly, I would say, yes, you are practicing data science. Now, if that is not your primary profession, you might not want to use you know, data scientists. Just like if you are not cooking all day in a kitchen commercially, you're probably not a professional cook, you're probably not a chef, right? But that doesn't mean you don't cook. Um, and, and one of the challenges that I think comes with titles is this sort of this very, very binary, either you are or you aren't. Well, it's a spectrum. Um, the person who's behind the grill at the local uh, Mexican restaurant, you know, are they a Michelin star chef? No. Are they a good enough chef? Yes. Uh, I think their food is terrific. Um, it's better than what I would do. Uh, and so I think there's that spectrum with things like data science and data analytics. Are you an analyst? If you are can use Google Analytics, you might not be a professional analyst where that's your job 40 hours a week, but you are absolutely performing analytical tasks and, and getting analytical results. If you are doing scientific testing, you are performing data science tasks. And should you call yourself a data scientist? Probably not from a, a, you know, a, a hiring perspective, but is data science part of your role? Yes, it is. And I feel like that's really the conversation um, because right now there's a lot of people looking for jobs and they're trying to, you know, the advice that we tend to give is to tailor your resume to highlight your experience for the job that you're yeah. after. If I start promoting myself as a data scientist because I've asked the question why, you know, am I mis misrepresenting myself because... I'm really good at asking why, but I don't know how to use advanced techniques like, you know, retroactive A-B testing and regression and, you know, machine learning. You might not be a, a qualified data scientist, but that mindset would be a very good mindset to pair with a junior data scientist, someone who has a lot of skills, but doesn't have professional experience, right? Somebody who's just out of the, a data science program or just out of college and and they lack the real world experience they lack the 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 practical application to know when to ask why and crucially to know when to stop asking why and move on with your day <laughs> uh to stop falling down rat holes um that there is something there now again i don't think you could plausibly get hired as like a principal data scientist at say facebook that, that's probably not going to happen but I do think that your skills allow you, and, and there's empirical proof literally sitting in front of you right now, um, that you can manage a data scientist quite capably. So I could call myself a data science manager, but I can't call myself a data scientist. That's right, because with everything, it's it's a combination of skills, of experience, of, of theory, uh, and when when you are someone who has the experience and you know some of the theory, yes, you lack the skills, so you're not a data scientist in, in that regard, but that would permit you to manage it because a lot of the time you don't need to know, you know, should I use the the file library or the FF package to deal with the large JSON file in R? It, do you really need to know that? No. What do you need to know? Hey, what's the most efficient way Design. to open a large JSON file to process it, like a six gigabyte JSON file. A, a data scientist would have, or actually a data engineer would know those, those answers to say, okay, you should be using the FF package to read that file in chunks so that your R instance just doesn't completely explode all over, right? And, and your computer shuts down. Um, but from a strategic perspective, you would be asking the question, how can we make this code more memory efficient, how can we make this code a higher performing? Right? And and knowing those questions to ask is, is critical to that because uh, particularly a junior data scientist and a junior data engineer is going to get so lost in the minutia that they don't see the big picture. I feel like 
data scientist versus data analyst versus data engineer, in some ways, is just kind of splitting hairs. Um, you know, because you could argue for both sides that you could argue that they all need to be their own separate disciplines, or you could argue that they're all the same thing. It's just a matter of what job function you're performing for any given task. And so is it, and this is just a genuine, you know, question, you know, can you have data science and data engineering skills, but really you're an analyst? Or Absolutely. is it that you're a data scientist and you have analyst capabilities? Like, is it all one and the same and it just it's dependent on who you're talking to? Or are they really individual disciplines? So this is where you do get some of the gray area. Mm -hmm. Data analytics is a subset of data science, right? You cannot be a data scientist without analytics skills. Mm -hmm. Just can't. Okay. You can be an analyst without data science skills, right? You can just be a straight up analyst uh, whose profession is to, you know, clean, prepare, analyze data and stuff like that. Um, both of them do need some level of data engineering skill, but data engineering truly is its own profession. It's it's much more closer to IT, um, okay. you know, data storage structures, uh, hierarchies, normalization of data, optimization, queries, key index keys, uh, all these different things that go into making data, particularly large amounts of data, as efficient as possible, knowing when you need to normalize and, and denormalize data sets. A data scientist and a data analyst might need to know some aspects of that, but they are probably very rarely going to be in the weeds saying, okay, well, you know, what type of, of file format? Should we use we using NDJSON? Should we be using Parquet? You know, what's what's the the, the, the structure underneath that makes to make this data work the best? That's not really not something that data scientists and data analysts uh, ever tangle with uh, data analysts, you know, it's like, okay, is it an Excel or not? <laughs> um, it's it, it is where that question usually starts, particularly when you get to massive data, like, uh -huh. uh, you know, things like BigQuery and Redshift and, and all these cloud providers where your compute power is just beyond what you can reasonably have on a desktop or even a server at your company. So, Again, I think it goes back to what is the majority of your day, right? Uh -huh. If the majority of your day is, you know, looking at storage arrays and stuff, yeah, you're probably a data engineer. Um, do you need to do, have analytic skills to understand, like, how much, how efficient is the code that's running? Yes, you do. Um, does that make you a data analyst? No, not really. When I was managing uh, development teams, we used to get into similar stuff debates, conversations, arguments, whatever you want to call them, about the different kinds of roles. And very similar to data scientists versus data an uh, analyst versus data engineering, we had database architect, developers, front-end developers, and back-end developers. And for someone who wasn't close to the process, they would just say, well, everybody's working with you know the code and the technology. It doesn't matter who I go talk to. And the people who were in those roles, understandably, got very protective of the things that they do. And, you know, we were constantly as an organization trying to figure out, have we made these roles too discreet or can one person do more than one thing? And what we found, at least in this instance, was we needed separate front end and back end developers. So people who worked on the UI versus people who worked on the underlying code that made the website run. We needed a separate database architect because of the amount of protected health information and personally identifiable information that we needed to figure out how to house and access versus a developer who would just create the widgets and functions and things once the data was accessed. And so we did need all of those discrete roles. Plus we needed a separate QA person because, you know, you should never be testing your own thing because you're too close to it. So that's sort of, uh, I'm looking at you, Chris. <laughs> but I see this as a similar conversation of, sure, you can have a data analyst who does data science and data engineering. However, if you want to get more sophisticated, if you want to mature your data organization, you should probably have at least a data scientist and 
a data engineer and someone who does the analysis. So those are three separate roles. Chris, you, because of the size of our company, perform all three roles. But at some point, the goal is to have you as leading the data science and then have a team of analysts and engineers who are performing the functions as you're directing them. Or just machines. I mean, specialize, specialization correlates with scale. Right? Mm-hmm. You, you nailed it exactly. At a mom and pop cafe, yeah, you're working the grill, you're you're making salads, you're doing all this stuff, right? When you are a massive multinational food chain, <clears throat> you have specialization roles for everything, right? You, know, you have the fry, the person who's on the fry line, you have the person who's on the burger line, you have the person who's on the front end, you have the person who is cleaning stuff, you have the person on drive through. <clears throat> Could one person do all those tasks? Yes, and and you know, particularly in in the you know retail uh, companies. One person can change role to role to role. Like today, you're on the burger line. Tomorrow, okay. you're, you're managing the frying machine. The same is true in, in data science, data analytics, and data engineering. Uh-huh. When you're small, you kind of got to do it all. Um, and then as you scale, if you want to scale, you have to specialize in the same way that you know the sushi chef should probably not also be making desserts. Um, it's like, hey, look, there's tuna in my cupcake. Uh, <laughs> uh, just just from a, a, a perspective, you yeah, yeah, your data scientist, it comes down to, are you leveraging that person's strengths uh-huh. to the to the maximum benefit of the organization, right? Uh, and there will come a time when my skills are not best used to put it together social media updates, right? Um, uh-huh. Right now at our scale, it's fine, <laughs> particularly since GPT is doing most of it. Um, you know, chat GPT just cranks out tweets for us. That That's fine. Um, but as we, as we scale... As we want to scale, we have to specialize. And with that, you know, there's pros and cons to that as well. So when you have one person performing many job functions, you have a little bit more of a shared understanding. So Chris, you then see the data science and the data analytics and the data engineering. So you have the uh, transparency into all of those pieces. As you start to specialize, you run the risk of siloing. And so your data scientist maybe doesn't talk with your data engineer as often as they should. And so you start to have that breakdown in communication instead of that collaboration. And then if your data engineer decides to resign and move on to a different job, then you no longer have that skill set versus you have one person doing all three roles. So there's pros and cons to each of those scenarios and it really just depends on the amount of risk you're willing to take on in terms of if i lose my data scientist but i still have a data analyst and a data engineer can things continue to move forward or if i have one person doing all three jobs and i lose that person can i replace that with one person can i afford to find three different people to replace that one person and so there's definitely you know, ways to think about approaching the specialization versus the generalization. There are. And, you know, we saw that firsthand when we left our old company. Uh-huh. They lost 100% of their data science capabilities immediately. And a lot of the code that we'd written stopped working within three months because code evolves and changes and libraries change and nobody kept anything up to date. Uh-huh. Um, the the antidote, at least from what you've taught me over the over the years, is is twofold. One, you have cross training. You have uh-huh. people who cross train with each other. And two, uh, the thing that I used to hate but don't anymore is standard operating procedures, which is the recipes, the cookbook. Like, it, uh-huh. and and this is this is the thing that got me over that fear that other people wouldn't do it right. Is if I can look at the recipe and say the recipe is correct, you just now need to follow the recipe. Then, as long as the recipes good enough a person should be able to get the result that that the recipe dictates right now there will be there will be subtle variations and stuff and if there's the variations are too far then you know the recipe is not good enough and i feel like we can spend some time talking about how that comes together because that's sort of what we were talking about on our live stream last week was in terms of prompt engineering it's a lot like delegation creating those recipes is the same thing you need to be setting the expectation. And if you didn't write down the recipe correctly and you ask somebody to follow it yes. and they perform it incorrectly, you need to go back to the start and say, what did I not delegate correctly versus what did this person not do correctly? And so it goes 
that becomes part of it is can, do you feel like you have the tools then to delegate to a data scientist and a data analyst and a data engineer versus one person who's doing all three things? Exactly. When you look at a, go- a cookbook, a good cookbook is probably what? One half, two thirds, maybe even three quarters pictures, right? Like here's here's what the you know, here's what this should look like now. Here's what the, the finished dish should look like. And, you know, there's the, that whole Pinterest meme of the way it's supposed to be and the way it actually turns out uh, and, and the horrifying things look like. But the same is true for the standard operating procedures. Okay. I'm in the midst of writing out um, a book on uh, private social media communities and I have literally written out recipes like here's how you do this. Here's how, if you want to increase engagement for um, a, a specific topic, here's the recipe for this. And it's it, it's just a question of how specific and how detailed you want to be to get the result. And and there are cases where you're sometimes too specific, where you don't need to list out every single thing. Right? Okay. That's that's an experience thing. But you know, going back to data science and data analytics, if you have recipes for Hey, here's how you process a JSON L file, and it's a piece of code, but the code is reasonably well documented. Then you can say, "Here's here's here's how this works." Fun tip: going back to last week's live stream, you can put your code into some of these large language models and say, "Please write the documentation for the code." Um, and so, if you are a programmer like me who doesn't like writing documentation, now machines can do it for you, and then you can just you know tune it up. But it's mm-hmm. a great way to to improve your code without, again, from the, the the technical person's perspective, wasting all that time doing documentation. No, there's 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 now help available to you. Uh, yeah, documentation is not a waste of time. By the way, for those listening, uh, it is, and you know, again, that's a topic we could cover in depth yeah. as to why it's not a waste of time. But back to your point, Chris, about the scalability that documentation is needed. If you want to go from having a generalist to having different specialists, because then you have to do that cross training and then you need to have those redundancies in place in case one third of the, you know, the three people decides to leave. Um, So going back to the original question, data science versus data analytics versus data engineering, what I've learned in this conversation is that data science is the umbrella it's sort of like the top of the pyramid and then within the data science discipline you have functions of data and data analytics and data engineering and probably data qa and other pieces that go into that um data design storytelling all of those things they fall under that main umbrella of data science is that an accurate or a mostly accurate understanding? It, it is. And what I would suggest doing is to make things as clear as possible in your own roles. This is going to sound familiar. Um, write out user stories. Like what's the user story of a data scientist? Why okay. do you need a data scientist in your organization? As a manager, I need a data scientist to understand the perform what will perform better for my email marketing program, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you say that, you go, okay, I, it's pretty clear you need a data scientist. But if you said as a, a marketing measure, I need a data scientist so that I can understand my Google Analytics. Nope. Now you need you know, you need a data analyst, right? Because it's a different role. So that writing out those user stories will help you better understand what do you actually need. Uh-huh. And I, I mean, it always goes back to requirements of some kind before you start to hire for any role. What is the problem I'm trying to solve? If I'm trying to hire a data scientist Ugh. just so I can say I have a data scientist, probably not the best use of their time. And I know, Chris, you've been approached before to join teams, organizations, agencies, just because of the fact that you <laughs> hold data scientists, but really they want someone who's going to be in the trenches doing all of the, you know, 101 analysis. And so it's a mismatch and it really does come down to what's the problem I'm trying to solve by having this role, by having this skill set. And for us, it makes sense because we deal with large quantities of data. And the number one question we have to ask is, why did that happen? What, what, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> exactly. And 
I will say that if you do the requirements gathering and the analysis properly, you will save yourself months of headache, you know, uh, possibly some st stomach lining and potentially millions of dollars because you will not waste an enormous amount of time up front and have to, to redo everything. We have seen that time and again with any number of clients uh, where they jump into something without having done that that prep work to say, okay, so what are we cooking? And, you know, they, they were halfway through with some sushi rolls like, yeah, 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 but this is a pizzeria. <laughs> Nobody wants sushi here. It's, it's great. I mean, you can make like a, a pizza flavored sushi roll, I guess, but uh, probably no one's going to want that or very few people are going to want that. And, you know, as, as a commercial plug, I would say if you are considering things like a, a major uh, scene learning or AI project and you're not sure about that requirements gathering part, mm -hmm. do you help with that. I was watching... Uh very early this morning there's a show on food network called worst cooks in america which is both <laughs> it's it's half entertaining half anxiety inducing but there's <laughs> a, it's basically the formula reality show but on on the episode that i was watching this morning one of the quote-unquote worst cooks was having a full-on meltdown because they were overwhelmed and the chef who's the coach was like this is why I really need you to do your mise en place, which is basically things in place. It's the prep work that you do ahead of time to say, I know I'm going to need two onions. So here's my two onions. I know I'm going to need, you know, a green bell pepper. Let me make sure I have that. And so you get all of your things. It's your requirements gathering. And she was sharing with him. She's like, this is why we do it so that we don't get overwhelmed. So we don't start to panic when everything is a mess and we can't find everything. It's the exact same thing with business requirements. And Chris, the fact that you are the one who gave that PSA and not me makes me feel like my job is done. If I can get <laughs> the Chris Penn to start with wanting people to do requirements of documentation, my job is done. I'm out. <laughs> it's because we've had clients in particular who didn't and we know just how painful that is. Um, uh -huh. You know, I, there's this one client I'm thinking of, we've been working with them for, for a very long time and it took years to get the basics in place because they didn't do any requirements gathering. And even today, we are still fixing things that should have been fixed years ago, but because they didn't make some key decisions, they didn't have the right people in place, they didn't have uh -huh. no processes at all, it's it's been kind of a, a, a Sisyphean task, if you will, uh, pushing that boulder up the hill. As I get you know older and more experienced in this job, it's like yeah, you kind of want to stop doing the same thing over and over again. You kind of want to maybe do something a little bit new, or uh, you want to to reduce some of the drudgery, and the drudgery can be reduced by that preparation. So as much fun as it isn't sometimes, it's it's like everything you see over a long enough time horizon, the time you spend on the preparation is the time you save uh, in production. It's absolutely true. Very practical example of that. I was making biscuits yesterday for uh, dinner and because I've just done it so often, I knew I was going to need salt. I knew I was going to need baking powder. I knew I was going to need, you know, the various ingredients. Because when I first started making them, I didn't have all of that stuff ready. And then with biscuit dough all over my hands, I'm trying to find the other ingredients that I need. And I'm just making a mess in my kitchen. Now, this is a very small, you know, <laughs> manageable example. But because I was prepared, they came together faster. I didn't make a mess in my kitchen. I didn't have, you know, big dough hands that I was touching everything with and then had to reclean and sanitize. It's the same thing with those creating those requirements. And so if you're considering a data scientist versus a data analyst versus a data engineer, as Chris has mentioned, write down that user story, write down those requirements, try to have a better understanding of the question that you're trying to answer, the problem that you're trying to solve, and that's going to help you figure out what kind of role you need and you may need all three and that's fine but then you can at least when you bring that person on 
you can say this is the problem that you're trying to solve this is the problem that the data engineer is trying to solve instead of you know just sort of a okay here's the data good luck exactly and if you're thinking in your own career about the you know the skills and professional growth that you want to to nurture look at those questions how do we how do we work with this data right how do we store this data how do we process this data that's data engineering what happened in the data what is you know what are the the kpis what are the the metrics where what happened last week that's data analysis uh, those are analytic skills why did these things happen what can we do to, to reproduce them what can we do to fix things that went wrong um what should we be looking at next those are data science skills and kind of circling back to where i started you may not have the title of data engineer or data scientist but if you have those skills they make you more valuable on the flip side, if you are a, a manager or an executive in your organization and you are looking at hiring, write out the user stories, write out the use cases, write out all that stuff, because you may find that you have people in your organization who have it's the skills. They may not have the title. They have the okay. skills or they have the aptitude. And you could save yourself a lot of money and possibly help retain staff uh-huh. by letting them branch out and and grow their capabilities on problems that need solving. Agreed. Agreed. Um, All right. Well, I feel like I actually learned a lot about data science versus data analyst. Um, So, Chris, thank you for sharing your experience and that information. Um, So, as Chris mentioned, if you are looking to, you know, enhance your team just or even just get an understanding of the skill sets that you already have, you know, give us a shout. Uh, trustinsights.ai slash contact and you know we're happy to help you start to unravel um, what's going on and what you need exactly and if you've got comments or questions about anything we've talked about in this show that you just want to chat about in general pop on over to our free slack group go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers where you and over 3,000 other marketers are asking answering each other's questions every single day and wherever it is you watch or listen to the show if there's a channel you'd prefer to have it on we probably have it go to trustinsights.ai slash ti podcast and you can find all the options there thanks for tuning in and we will talk to you next time 